33% from 2020 and added up to $2.4 billion in losses last year. So what does this mean for the average American? With us now to give us his thoughts is the founder and executive director of the National Security Institute, Jamil Jaffer. Jamil, good to see you. Thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Veronica. Great to be here. So uh, what is a BEC scam? I mean, how does this differ from a cyber attack, a, a, a ransomware attack? I mean, who do they target? How do they work? Sure. The way this works, Veronica, is typically somebody will try to infiltrate your business computer system uh, through your typical way, you know, a phishing email or the like. Then they'll lie in wait. They'll watch what your pattern of behavior is. They'll watch for business transactions and then try to insert themselves in the middle of a business transaction oftentimes to try and get the money instead of going to the right person to them. So, for example, they'll watch your payments to vendors. And when you go to pay a vendor or the like or, or, or fulfill a contract, they'll step in and say, send them send the money here. And you'll mistakenly transmit the money to them instead of the person that it was designed to go to. So it's a form of phishing, cyber hacking that we've seen before, but very specific to uh, the business context and very lucrative for these scammers. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sure I've seen a couple of these in my inbox. And like we were just saying, Jamil, in the first years, the U.S. has seen, in the first few years, the U.S. has seen a huge increase in BEC scams, or the last few years, rather. So what are businesses doing at this point? I mean, what are the key factors here when it comes to uh, this rise, in, when it comes to the rise in these types of crimes? Sure. Well, look, you know, uh, one of the challenges is in the post, uh, you know, COVID pandemic era, if we can say that now, um, we see a lot of folks targeting uh, users both at home and um, and at work um, for these type of compromises because they can use getting into your home systems and potentially cross over your business devices. So it's one thing to be careful at work. It's also important to be careful at home. Part of it is training, making sure you're looking out for these type of phishing emails and the like. And then part of it is IT security, working with your security shop. If you have a suspicious email, let them know. They'll have systems in place to, one, triage that email, but also to watch them on the way in to protect against them. And so the best thing you can do as an individual user is to watch for these phishing things. Anything that looks suspicious, looks like it might be coming from HR, but not something you expected. Reach back out to your, your executives, your HR folks. And oftentimes it looks like it's email coming from an authorized source. Make sure to be very skeptical and push it over to your IT security team if you have any questions like that. Okay, I was looking at your bio earlier, and I believe that you started your career in the IT department on Capitol Hill. So I thought that was <laughs> it was so interesting. And obviously, you have a lot of expertise when it comes to this subject. Is there anything in particular that we we should be looking at in these emails, misspelled words, or so on and so forth? Yeah, you know, unfortunately, misspelled words were used to be the sign that it was a, it was a somebody coming after you, somebody who didn't necessarily have a familiarity with the English language or the like. Uh, but now more and more we're seeing these emails get sophisticated. So what you've got to watch out for is things you don't expect, things that are unusual, a, even things that look like they come from an authorized user, uh, but that are asking you to do something different, something unusual, like send the payment to this place instead of that place. You know, things that might happen in the normal course of business, always good. Pick up the phone, ask the person, hey, did you really send this email? No shame in doing that. Send a text message, whatever it takes, right, in order to make sure you're doing the right thing. And if you have any any, any sort of doubts, Send it to your IT security team, follow up with the person who sent it, make sure it's legit before you send a large transaction or money or confidential information. You know, look, one of the things is the the, the FBI just cracked down on a big group, about 65 people they arrested over the course of three months, $51 million taken out of businesses just over the course of a few months uh, by the scammer group. It was called Operation Eagle uh, and the like and that the FBI conducted just last year in September. Wow, $51 million. I want to go ahead and shift gears for a second, Jamil, and talk about the war in Ukraine. How worried should the U.S. and its allies be when it comes to cyber warfare on behalf of Russia? Well, you know, Veronica, it's one of the real threats that comes out of this conflict. We've seen all the damage that the Russians have done, the Ukrainian people targeting civilians, the schools, the hospitals, and the like. They've also engaged in a significant number of malware attacks, cyber attacks against uh, Ukraine and its and its businesses. Now they may turn towards the West, towards America and our allies to come after us to punish or to deter us from engaging in as much support for Ukraine as we're giving. And so you, what you might see is the targeting of American critical infrastructure and the like. I think the Russians know better than to get engaged in a major attack against our critical infrastructure, but you might see smaller attacks. And oftentimes the Russians hide behind criminality as a cover for nation state activity. So something to watch out for. I'd imagine that's why we see so much misinformation and dis disinformation at the end of the day. And I know that you've been there in Washington. I know you've been doing a lot of work around this. So are the president and the federal government doing enough? And do you feel like we are prepared in this instance? 
Well, look, we've done a lot. Our key industries, financial services, electric power and the like, have done a lot to improve their defenses, not just over the last few years, but even in the last few months. That being said, there's always more work to be done. The government and industry are working pretty well together today. You've got Jenny Sirleo over at the Department of Homeland Security. We're in the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative. You've got you've got Chris Inglis at the White House. You've got a lot of good folks, Paul Nakasone at NSA, General Paul Nakasone. So a lot of good work going on between the White House, the NSA, DHS, and industry, but more to be done. It's really important for industry to share information with the government and with one another across multiple industries, across multiple sectors to really get that collective defense system going is one company can't do it on its own. Yeah, Veronica. you're saying there needs to be a little bit more transparency between businesses and industries at the end of the day. Founder and executive director of the National Security Institute, Jamil Jaffer, thank you so much for your time and expertise on the uh, subject. We appreciate it. Thanks. All right, let's go ahead and head over to the White House now. Press Secretary Jen Psaki is giving her daily news briefing. Let's go ahead and take a listen right here.